everyone welcome back and today we are going to be uh, reviewing some content about reading nutrition science research and for those of you who are following along in the nutrition for food technology course at Niagara College being able to interpret the scientific literature is really important as part of your role as a food technologist who is going to often be justifying scientific research to justify the types of product development or the types of initiatives that you might be doing within some of the food companies that you might join. And so we're going to take some time to delve into what are we seeing when we're reading actual um, food science or nutrition research. So at the end of this video, you'll be able to justify where you are obtaining your nutrition information from. You'll differentiate between pop culture resources versus scientific resources for nutrition. You'll describe a variety of different scientific studies used in nutrition research, and it will evaluate the quality of nutrition research and nutrition communication and its relevance to human health. And you may see my little face in the bottom corner. I have been listening to some feedback from all of you. And one person said, hey, it would be really nice to see you and see you actually talking. So welcome. Um, hi, and <laughs> welcome to my office. So back, at, back when I did my uh, doctoral studies at Iowa State University, I did a combined study in an interdepartmental graduate program in combined food and nutrition science, and it was actually really cool. And so it gave me a chance to delve into re nutrition science research quite a bit as part of my work. My, my research was in biofortification, and so understanding the genetics of plants and how it improved nutritional and food processing quality of different staple crops. So it was really important to do that uh, reading. Oftentimes, people go and get their facts about nutrition from the pop culture. And right now, social media is just such a prevalent space where people are getting all sorts of fads and all sorts of different um, ideas about what's healthy and nutritious. In our previous uh, slide presentation, we talked about defining between scientific research versus fads and uh, how influencers are uh, changing the, the uh, changing the, the landscape when it comes to what people are choosing to eat. And in this case, um, the social media and the internet media is just so prevalent in how it's influencing people and their decisions. And it's important for us as scientists to be able to discern between the two. I'm, I, as I said in the previous slideshow, I'm not against people making money, but I'm against people being manipulative in a negative way that's going to um, try and give people an impression that they're getting a benefit that they're not actually going to be able to get. So think, think quite seriously, where are you getting your, nutrition's, uh, your nutrition facts or your nutrition information? So often it's coming from uh, different news organizations. I've got a, a screenshot here of NPR, which is National Public Radio out of the United States. And some news organizations are better than others. Um, how about some of these lifestyle magazines or the Huffington Post Living is, is the screenshot that I've got here. Honestly, um, there's lots and lots of different information. And one of the first things that I often ask people is double check who's written this article. In this case, it's Dr. John Dempster, who's a naturopathic doctor here in Canada. Naturopathic doctors are a licensed um, discipline and naturopathy has some relevance in science, but a lot of it is also based off of placebo effect. And so think about who are who is authoring that report and what sort of biases they may be introducing into their reporting. Is it just someone who is a pop culture writer? Is it someone who has scientific credentials? And honestly, it's not hard to look people up and see their uh, presence. Someone who's a legitimate scientist is going to have a fingerprint on the internet showing the publications that they've written, the organizations that they're affiliated with, and so on. And that's important to think about when considering the quality of that work. Does this person have a reputation for working in this field and as such has cultivated a strong scientific following? 
We will delve into a bit more of the scientific literature, but here is a website, it's called PubMed, and PubMed just happens to be one of the largest databases for scientific literature. And we will talk a little bit about what makes for a quality paper, but uh, in general, if it has made it into PubMed as the database that's compiling well-researched scientific papers, there's going to be a bit more legitimacy here. Now, that said, there's nothing stopping me from turning on a web page and starting a blog and calling it a scientific paper, the, the Journal of Amy's Grand Ideas, and have my friends publish in there. And then I could apply to PubMed. And so it's, it is worth taking a look at what is the quality of this paper. There are impact factors that can indicate um, how, how important is that paper in terms of how many uh, references it's getting. There are ways of inflating impact factors, but also take a look at how old the paper is. If the paper was only uh, started, or the journal was only started in the past, uh, in the past few years, then it's, it's more likely to be one of these, what are known as predatory journals. They're somewhat pretend and they take advantage of the fact that within much of the scientific community, people's, um, people's employment or people's ability to get promoted within their work is based off of how many scientific papers it, it, uh, they have published. I'm really fortunate that I'm in an environment where my performance is based off of um, how well I teach my courses, how well I'm able to help find students find relevant employment, and how many industry partners I help. Not necessarily based off of how many papers I write. And so um, it's it's challenging when the impact is based off of how many papers you write. It's, it is then tempting for scientists to then want to take advantage of some of these predatory journals where it's quite easy to get your paper published. So do be careful when finding papers in PubMed or other what appear to be scientific papers online. Do make sure they're coming from reputable journals and snoop around to see what the reputation of these journals are. You'll see some of these organizations, some of these publishers like Elsevier or Wiley, um, they are extremely well, um, they're well-regarded publishers. And if you see that there's a, a, a good publisher behind the publication, that's also a very good sign. Oh, <laughs> I have Facebook up here. And honestly, so many people right now are, are saying, well, I got, I, where, you'll ask the question, well, where did you get the information about this trend or that trend? Well, I found it on Facebook. I found it on my Instagram. I found it on TikTok. Social media can be a good source of information, but again, it comes back to who are the reliable sources that you're getting that information from. Are you linking out to a legitimate news organization? Are you linking out to a legitimate scientific organization? And even then, some scientific organizations put out better quality material than others. I know that there are some organizations and they put out their helpful hint of the day, and that's lovely and fine, but other scientific organizations will put out, here's a link to our most recent publication, or here's, uh, here's some quotes from some of our uh, research scientists that are members of the organization, take a look and dig deeper. Don't just take what you see on face value. Oh, then, then <laughs> I'm laughing. Um, there are all sorts of lifestyle web pages where people are just out there saying all sorts of different things. And there's nothing stopping because of freedom of speech. There's nothing stopping people from just starting a web page and writing about what they want. And there are lots and lots of web pages that are out there putting out what appears to be nutrition guidance that has no relevance in the scientific uh, facts. And so again, just because someone has a lot of followers and has a lot of uh, hits or a lot of comments on their web page, you'll see there's 29,000 likes and whatever. That doesn't necessarily mean that it is scientifically relevant. It means that it's a good trend and these individuals may be uh, core influencers within within the industry within the industry or within the, the 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 side elements of the industry but they're not necessarily scientists they don't necessarily have designations so again take a look find out more dig in deeper to find out what sort of credentials or um, academic or 
workplace experiences they may have to be able to legitimately deliver good scientific information. There are times when it's okay to go and research many of these trends and find out what consumers are interested in and find out what the pop culture is writing about because there are ways of positioning that from a, from a profitability perspective, but it's important to then not try and represent it as science. At a later point, um, we, once we start getting into the topic of doing nutrition labeling, we will talk about what to do in terms of legitimizing a health claim for a food product. And we'll, we'll walk through the regulatory uh, processes for doing that. But don't just take the claims that you see here on face value, because in uh, the claim here, grains are killing you slowly. Well, there have been many, 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 many scientific um, reviews of showing that uh, diets uh, with lots of whole grains are quite healthy and people can live quite a long life eating whole grains. And that's it's a silly claim for them to say, well, grain is killing you. Now, there are um, organizations that put out trade journals and um, these are more scientifically driven, but they are often driven with a profit oriented purpose. And so trade journals oftentimes are, um, I want to say the term advertorial, where a sponsor will sponsor an article and it will promote a certain ingredient or a certain um, piece of information. I totally recommend you reading trade journals. And there's a, there's a reason why. Many of these trade journals will help you uh, understand the, the lingo or the jargon that's used in the industry. You'll start to pick up on the vocabulary that people in the industry say, and that's part of becoming the part of a professional within this field. Um, you do want to double check if you're reading articles in the trade literature. Foodnavigator.com is a great web page. Um, there's, there's magazines like Food in Canada. Who I, I, I'm a big fan of Food in Canada. Um, other ones, uh, Food Technology Magazine is a great one. Um, Canadian Grocer talks a lot about trends and product development in Canada. There are a lot of different sector magazines like The Meeting Place or Baker's Journal. Um, food Safety and Quality is a magazine uh, that's focused on, as you can guess, food safety and quality. There's lots of them out there and they are much better quality than some of those life lifestyle magazines and they are often written by specialists in the field. But again, sometimes those articles are sponsored and so they have um, different agendas for wanting to sell an ingredient so do be aware of that and and be careful, but don't shy away from reading trade journals at the same time. I think it's really important. And one of the core messages here is read all of it. Read, read, read and read some more when you have some more time. The more you can read, the more you are going to succeed at this. So just to quickly summarize here, pick your facts carefully. So the mainstream media has good gateway information. What do I mean by gateway information? You'll want to uh, scan that mainstream media to find out what is trending, what are some core stories that are going on in the news. And in many cases, you're going to triangulate. So for example, when we saw about the pandemic coming, we knew that people would be shifting to a lot of uh, shelf-stable products and products that could be stored for a long period of time. And uh, companies that uh, were paying attention out of the global media knew in advance and were able to start changing their supply chain. So the academic literature, PubMed, Google Scholar, that's going to give you access to the scientific and peer reviewed literature, but do be sure to make sure that you're double checking that that journal that you're looking at is not just someone popping open a web page and calling it a journal. There are a lot of fly by night and pardon me, uh, predatory journals that are out there, make sure that you are selecting for high quality journals and look for scientists that have um, extensive experience in the field to help set the, uh, set the tone of what you want to be looking at. Blogs are great for looking at trends and public opinion, but blogs are usually not reliable for science. There are some good science blogs, but in general, they are not that great. The few, the few good science blogs that are out there, you can find the credentials and find the experience of the writers that are behind them. And again, trade journals give scientific viewpoints, but they're cherry-picked and they're 
uh, selected by PR offices. PR is uh, public relations offices, and they're often sponsored. And sometimes they're sponsored by um, different post-secondary institutions that want to promote their work and promote their research agenda. And again, that's that's totally fair and totally legitimate as long as you understand that's the agenda behind what they're writing. Now, let's dig into a little bit here. Actually, you know what? I'm going to stop this video and make a second short video. Something that uh, I got some feedback last week. Uh, students like the videos when they're nice and short. And so I'm going to try and keep them nice and short. And instead of having longer videos, keep them uh, around 20 minutes. And that way you can watch and rewatch as you need. Some people have told me they watch the videos in double time so that they can watch them multiple times. Other people have told me they're using closed captioning or the transcriptioning so they can read along. And indeed, some people are using the closed captioning, but also then using the translate feature. And so when you're doing a short video, you can synthesize that information better. And so I'm going to stop here and then restart with a second video when I'm going to talk about the types of papers that are common in the scientific literature. All right, take care and we'll see you in just a moment for the second video.